Well, here we are on the last Sunday of the year, <laughs> and it's good to be with you. I am still recovering from bronchitis and laryngitis and a few things, but I'm very thankful to have a voice today. Very glad to be with you, and I'm glad I can actually speak a little bit today. Pastor Mike's on the other side of the mountain. He's over preaching in Yakima at the Baptist Church over there with his former worship pastor, uh, Larry, Larry Bull, and uh, Cindy is staying at their house. Him and Nancy left a couple days ago, and so he's able to bless them. They're still without a pastor after two years, and uh, so he's able to bless them with his teaching on the vine this morning. If you would open your Bibles to John 7 and 8. When Pastor Mike asked me to do this a few, um, actually a few weeks, months ago, I began to think about you know, how do you go from Christmas Eve on the 24th when Jesus is a baby and you get to the point where he's saying, I am the light of the world. And today we're focusing on, on, on these, um, the fifth message of the great I Am series that we've been walking through who Jesus is, who, who God sent as his son. And I can't think of a better time to explore this and look at this because if we pick up the story from Christmas Eve, his birth, his birth and where it happened, and now in this next 35 minutes, we're gonna cover 32 years of his life in 38 minutes. We're gonna focus on two pivotal uh, moments that happened in the temple when he was there to get to the point of saying, I am the light of the world. For at this time of the year, we celebrate Christmas with light. These are pictures from our home. I bring the lighted houses display out of the attic and I set it on our piano and we turn the lights off at night and we turn on the lights of the little Christmas village, the snow village. My husband went outside and put the lights on the outside of our house. Our, our neighborhood really gets into this. You can drive through the streets. There's lots of lights on houses. We light the candles. I'm a little crazy. I light them even for breakfast. I light them on the table. I like to have a couple lights, just candles there. And then we, we, we wind it up and we go to Christmas Eve, and that's my four-year-old, my favorite four-year-old four -year -old grandson, the only one that's four. And uh, we, at the very end of the day, we turn all the lights off in the house. It's very special. He can hardly wait for this. He keeps, I don't know if it's more the candles or the singing or the cake, but he's always opening the fridge saying, when are we gonna do this? And uh, so this little boy and his, his, actually his brother, the seven-year-old, was there also. But I love the innocence of the naivety of that little boy as he looked at those candles and as we sang, happy birthday, Jesus. Trees, lights, candles, ambience. The light comes into darkness. We celebrate that. It changes the darkness. It invades the darkness. It brings warmth if you turn on the fireplace, if you light the candle. If you can't see in the room, the first thing your hand does, it goes to the wall to turn on the light because you want to see, you want to have discernment, you want to be able to appreciate what's in the room. And you don't want to stay in the darkness. Light reveals God. It reveals Jesus Christ, the essence of who they both are. And today we talk about how light invades our soul through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity, picked up the Seattle Times after my husband leaves this service, he goes and picks up a Seattle Times and in it is the magazine section. They ran a story called Blinded by Light and knowing today was coming in curiosity, I picked this up later in the, in the afternoon. I read the article that stated how virtually all of the United States east of the Mississippi never falls into true darkness where the lights of the sky, the magnificence of the Milky Way, the stars are able to burn brightly and be seen. They go on to say if you want to view the galaxies and see the lights in the sky, you need to go to remote areas as you would often know this, like Mount Baker or Mount Rainier or Hurricane Ridge. And the article continues with what it meant to not experience the darkness fully and not be able to see the light because of fog or smog or environmental reasons. And they went on to say how it can affect animal habitat, the environment, the growth cycles of plants and trees and the hormonal cycles of humans. Light's essential for plants to grow. The photosynthesis, the growth, is all how they exist. They need oxygen, they need light. Light's essential for human beings because that's where we get our vitamin D. That's why I go stand near the window or I stand out here when the sun comes out in the exact light of how that light, the sun actually does come out and I stand there just to get a little bit of that vitamin D. 
It's actually a way that it, it helps us be able to replenish, helps us get energy back, helps us not go into seasonal light depression. And from the beginning, it was planned that we would have those times to pause. That's when we get tired, we need to sleep, we need to replenish. And I love the fact that God said in Genesis 1, we aren't able to stay in darkness because in Genesis 1, he said, he created the darkness and it was good, but he created the light and he said, let there be light. And it was so. It was the most interesting morning when I was studying this passage, one of the many mornings I was studying this passage. Because on Facebook, Larry Armstrong, one of our elders, our chairman of the elders actually, are out here in Enumclaw, and when I went to Facebook, he had posted this picture out his window. And what was simultaneous about that is my son, who has that same picture out his bedroom window in Puyallup, sent it to me by text. I almost had that simultaneously, and I, I said, Lord, thank you so much. Here I'm talking about darkness, and then there's light. And light dispels the darkness. It's the daily picture of what God wants for us to see spiritually about him, about us. And he uses the creation to talk about light and reveal who he is. Romans 1.20 says the very essence of deity is revealed in the material creation. The absolute unity of God being three persons in one is manifest in the material creation of light itself. It's the preeminent symbol of God himself as you will see later today in John 7 and 8. For in 1 John 5 through 7 it says God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, the Son, his Son, purifies us from all sin. How could the holy arrival of spiritual light and truth be born in a baby? A baby 2,000 years ago, a baby born into poverty, obscurity, into a stable full of stinky animals, deity in diapers came down, heaven came down, dependent on his earthly mom and dad for survival. How could deity in diapers make the statement of John 8, 12 that he is the light of the world? Mary and Joseph were part of this mystery unfolding that would change the course of history and the future for all mankind. They were looking at the face of God the third person of the Trinity. And scripture says it was the glory of God that was fully revealed, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It was revealed through Christ. The word became flesh, it dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, the glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and full of truth, John 1. Anyone who has seen him, who has seen Jesus, has seen the Father. John 14, God's light surrounded this child, God's favor was on this child. And as was custom in those days, within a week, the baby was circumcised on the eighth day. It was the first time the baby's blood was spilt. The son of God's blood was spilt. And within that month, Mary and Joseph take the baby to the temple for his baby dedication, which was the custom under the law. They take him to the very location where Jesus would stand 32 years later and would make this statement, I am the light of the world. And as they walk in, Simeon, the high, one of the priests of the temple, he'd been waiting a long time, he identifies Jesus as the light of their salvation. He quotes from the prophet Isaiah. He says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory to your people Israel has come. And now he has stated, at the birth of this child, one month into it, Christ's ultimate mission to the world. And meanwhile, out on the range, out there on the desert, the Magi, the wise men from the East, who had studied those consolations for years, they had read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, they had known that Numbers 24, 17 said, a star, a light will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of the tribe of Judah, out of Israel. The Messiah will come from Israel. He will be from the tribe of Judah. There'll be royalty in his veins. 
And they knew that the prophet Daniel had predicted he will reveal deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness. The light dwells in him is what Daniel the prophet said. They had studied the consolations and they had waited. And then a bright light came. It appeared the star was a light that was unique in the sky. And they followed that light across the Arabian desert, it says in Matthew 2. And when they found him, they said, for we have seen his star, his light, in the east and have come to worship him. And the scripture says that when the star, the light, stopped over the house, and we don't know exactly the timetable, 12 months to 18 months later, but it does say house and not stable. Where the child was, they brought gifts fit for the king. Many think that these gifts sustained Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in their poverty because they didn't have much. While they moved to Egypt with the boy Jesus after King Herod was, threatening by the, by the, was threatened by the news of a newborn king lying somewhere out there among the land. And he had proclaimed as the king that all babies under the age of two would be killed. And then Mary and Joseph waited. And they waited until it was safe to return to their homeland. And some time later, and we don't know the time frame, it could have been years, after Herod had died, they returned to Galilee to a town called Nazareth. And then there was silence for 30 more years. People had waited in hope and anticipation for over 400 years, from the conclusion of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament for their Messiah to come. There had been rumors, there was gossip. They had heard that a baby had been conceived out of wedlock. There was discussions about whose baby was it? Was it Joseph's or who? And the baby grew. We only know in scripture one other time before he appears at the age of 30 for his public ministry, but he appears in the temple at the age of 12, the year of his bar mitzvah during the Passover. He sits among the teachers and the rabbis and he's asking them questions. He's in the same temple that he was dedicated in and would eventually stand in 20 years later in John 7 and 8. And Luke 2.52 says he grew in wisdom and stature. God, man. The man, humanity's side is a little baby born as a baby to a boy, to a human being, a teenager, to a grown man. Luke 2.52 says he grew in wisdom. He kept learning, and he grew in physically in stature with both God and man. And Mary pondered all those things in her heart. At what point would she tell him the story? At what point would the mom tell the boy the angel's declaration, the immaculate conception, the prophecies that were written At what point would she pull the baby blanket out of the drawer that had the family history woven into it? Tribe of Judah, root of Jesse, lineage of King David, born in Bethlehem, Christ the Lord. For the next 21 years, he is now old enough to go to the feast. From the point of 12 on, boys at that point would go to the feast with their parents and grow up and start to be around other guys their age and they'd go to the Jerusalem and they'd go to the temple with their parents but eventually as individuals, as adults and experience, they would experience that spiritual significance of all that he'd heard from or heard about up until now. He was the son of God, but no one knew. He is the lamp of God, scripture says, the light of God. They were walking with God, expressed in human flesh as the son of God, and they didn't know he was there. Isaiah said spiritual light was going to bring clarity to their path so they wouldn't stumble. Isaiah went on to say the salvation of God will be manifested at a brightly burning lamp. And it would be through the Christ child and the Lord will be an everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Solomon said the word of God causes the path of the just to be illuminated. David said the prince of darkness cannot overcome the illumination of God's lamp. And the prophet Samuel 
personalize it, say, saying, you are my personal light. You are my personal lamp, O oh Lord. You turn my darkness into light. The holy light breaks into personal darkness. And now, 32 years later, after his birth, his growth, him going, and going on and, and being a carpenter's son, about a, about a year before he actually dies on the cross for our sins, it is now fall. It's the feast of the tabernacles. Something we don't talk about often because maybe because we're Gentiles and not Jewish historically heritage. It's the feast that they celebrate with Thanksgiving. It's their Thanksgiving because the harvest is en ended. It's the harvest of grapes. The wheat harvest was the feast before. The barley harvest was the one before that. There had been harvest. There, that's when the economy is good. And it's a time to be grateful. It's a time to rejoice. It's a time to bring back and come, to, come together. God's blessings had been flowing toward them for his provision that year. It's a year when they remembered when God's presence and provision in the past had been with them when they wandered in the desert for 40 years. God had tabernacled with them he had dwelt with them. It was a time to be grateful for what he had, when he had led them by day, a cloud by day, and a pillar of light, a pillar of fire at night. It's a time when God built the tabernacle for the Ark of the Covenant, and inside of that was the golden lampstand. The golden lampstand where there was fire, there was light, and it, it was to tell them of God's presence when they were tabernacled, when they were stopped, if they were not moving because the fire and the cloud led them as they went, but when they stopped, there was a flame on the golden lampstand in the tabernacle. And what's so interesting about this, when you look at this picture, this is what happens in Jerusalem today. Thousands of years later, people still remember the Feast of Tabernacles. There's rules in, in Jewish law and Jewish history and the menorah and the Mishnah and what it's actually supposed to look like and it's supposed to be a place, an enclosure where they could see the stars. Because in those days the stars guided them, the light led them. It's a place where they would go and live for seven days in the Old Testament. Today over there they don't actually live in those, they live in their homes, but they say that they actually go and spend maybe one meal a day through the, the Feast of Tabernacles but they still continue, continue because they're still waiting as Orthodox Jews for the Messiah to come. And in John 7, 1 through 13, now it's rolling it forward. Jesus is now in a place where he is going to the Feast of the Tabernacles, the place of celebration where thousands of people come. It's a yearly fe feast. It's a time where he had been there for the last 21 years. It's a place where he had walk God walked among them probably seeing millions of people over those 21 years. And what's so interesting is, is people never understood who he was. Chapter seven, verse one and two, there's a conflict going on between him and the religious leadership. And if you move on to the passage in, ch in chapter seven, verse, verses three through five, there's a conflict going on in his own human family because Jesus had half brothers and half sisters after his birth. His own biological half-brothers didn't understand who he was. The light in their mind and their soul had not even come on yet. It wasn't until after he died they got it. And so they challenge him to make this public appearance in the first part of chapter seven. And they say, you know, you go ahead and go in. And he responds to his brothers in verse six. He says, the right time for me has not yet come for you. Any time is okay. Any time is right to go to the feast. And then verse seven, he says to his half-brothers, he says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. Verse eight, you go to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast because the right time has not yet come. And after that, he stays back. He stays in Galilee. But in verse 10, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. When they were least expecting him, Jesus was never manipulated by people. He was not manipulated by people's expectations. He knew that in ministry and as a person who knew God the Father, that there's a spiritual right timing. 
And he wanted to be in sync with the Father's business, the Father's mission. God had a timetable, and he knew it. And he wanted to go filled with the, the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't want to go in his own human strength. God, man, the man trusting the Father is such an example to us. And in verse 11, now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, where is that man? And now filled with the Holy Spirit, in verse 14, halfway through the feast, Jesus shows up on the temple steps and he begins to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching. And they ask, how did this man get such learning without ever having studied? And Jesus replies to them in verse 15, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him, God. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. They can't hear with spirituals because their hearts were hardened. They can't see the spiritual light in front of them, the lamp of God standing there. And he was revealing the darkness in their hearts. He was revealing that they had a heart problem. They had spiritual blockage. And bringing spiritual clarity, spiritual light to their souls, he says, he, he says in verses 28 and 29, he cries out, it says in the scripture. He loudly expresses, he says, you know me and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him. I am from God the Father, and God has sent me. But at this point, verse 30, they try to grab him. They try to seize him, but no one could lay a hand on him because his time had not yet come. And they remain in spiritual darkness. They are blind to spiritual truth. They are deaf to spiritual truth. They cannot hear spiritually. He's attempting to start to quench their spiritual thirst. He and the Holy Spirit are in sync to bring clarity, to break through that hardness of heart. And what I love about Jesus is as he uses an everyday occurrence that they're experiencing during the Feast of the Tabernacles to make a spiritual point. He waits till the last day of the feast. And if you don't think God likes to party, go study the feast in the Old Testament. They've been partying for seven days. They stay up late and they get up early because they're so glad to be together. No TV, no cell phones, no other way to communicate when they go home. Their family, family has come together. It's a party, the Feast of Tabernacles. And then there's this process that takes place. The priests and the temples would lead this long procession. It's a parade coming out of the temple, if you see it on the left hand of the screen. They go down to the pool of Siloam to get the fresh water. What's interesting about that pool of Siloam, it was just rediscovered in 2004. A tractor fell through the dirt and there was something hollow, and they rediscovered that pool. But a parade with the priests leaving and thousands of people going with them and singing, and as they would go down to the pool of Siloam to get the fresh water, it was called the pool of living water. The high priest would take that golden pitcher. It's a decanter, and the gold speaks of royalty and purity and they would dip it into the pool. And that picture there is the exact replica right now that is in Jerusalem waiting for the rebuilt of the temple. 60 items have been prepared for when the dome of the rock changes back into the temple. And that's the picture of what I'm speaking about. The golden pitcher, they would take it, they would dip it into the pool of living water. The assistant priest alongside of him would carry the silver pitcher vase, and that came from that same place over in Jerusalem. They would dip, he would take it, and he would go down and he'd go back, and it is the fresh wine and the silver picture from the grape harvest, and silver speaks of redemption. It was full of the new wine. And one holds the living water and one holds the wine, symbolic of the blood being sacrificed, the animal sacrifice that's going on in the temple for the people's sins. 
They would walk down to the waters in a pilgrimage with thousands of people following them, and then they would get to the living water, and they'd go back up these steps, up to the grand staircase there, into the temple, and they would pour the wine on one quarter of the altar. And there's the altar, and actually it says in Scripture that it can't be with steps, it can't be a ladder, it has to be like a wheelchair ramp. It goes up. And they go up, on the, up there and they pour the wine, representing the blood on the altar, and they put the spiritual water, the living water from the pool of Siloam on the other end. They're singing the Hillel songs from Psalms, from 100, Psalm 113 on into 120, 130. The Lord is my strength, the Lord is my salvation is what they're singing. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacle, it says, and in the righteous. And they're singing that song and Jesus is standing there. Salvation is standing there among them when they're singing the psalm. And the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua or Jesus. And on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would sing Isaiah 12, two and three. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name be exalted. And scripture says at that point, Jesus stood. <laughs> you are drawing from the water of your salvation. I am the one that brings salvation. They always set to teach, but he stands to make a point, and he cries out in that loud voice in chapter 7, verse 37, 39, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And by this he met the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. He was already prophesying what would happen at Pentecost. And up to that point, the Spirit had not been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And he's prophesying, he's telling what will happen after the resurrection. He uses the symbolism of the water pouring ceremony by the priests in the temple to point to who he really is. He was calling people to recognize their spiritual thirst and come to faith and to drink deeply from the truth that he was offering to them. He would satisfy their deepest longing. He would quench their spiritual thirst if they trusted in him, if they believed in him, received the free gift of eternal life that he was offering them himself. And he uses the water pouring ceremony to make that profound messianic statement. And some got it. Verse 31 says, it says many in the crowd put their faith in him. And yet many continue like today to dispute and debate his messianic claims. Verse 40, surely this man is the prophet. Verse 42, does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family? Check. How could the Messiah ever come out of Galilee? Check into it, how did he get there? It's because it wasn't safe to go back to the, the homeland, the exact place where Mary and Joseph had come from. Doesn't the scripture say that he would come from Bethlehem? Just their questions show his ignorance. They were spiritually blind. They can't see the light. And the holy light was among them. He was in the process of becoming their, their own salvation and they were unaware of it. And as this heated debate continued, what does Jesus do? He doesn't get in an argument. He doesn't try to fight it out. He doesn't get into a verbal exchange. It says in chapter eight, verse one, he slips back out to the place of refuge that he had spent many nights. It says he slipped back out to the Mount of Olives, the place where he had gone to pray before he chose the 12. It's the place where the Garden of Gethsemane is at the bottom of the hill. Scripture says in Ezekiel that when the light, the Shekinah glory light, it left the tabernacle and it later left the temple it rested on the Mount of Olives. No wonder Jesus went there. The Shekinah light was always a place where God dwelled. And so Jesus sought his father to hear his heart, to, to get instructions for the next step, and lights drawn to light. 
Ezekiel 43, 45, Zechariah 14 tells us that when Christ comes again, the Mount of Olives is where his feet first touch the earth, and the earth will split. The very place Jesus went on the night of Gethsemane, the night, his last night physically, before he died for your sins, the very place Jesus went that night in John 8 is a place he's going to return to. Holiness, sacredness was in that place. And the next morning, John 8, 2, the lamp of our salvation, it says, at morning light, he appears again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. And in the glow of these temple lights, and he's sitting in the largest part of the temple, it's called the Court of Women. A woman is drug in before him, she's caught in adultery, which this part of the scripture doesn't usually stand out or is in most early manuscripts, but it's in our NIV, so it's in this passage today. It's brought, it's, she's brought before him by the Pharisees, the religious of the day, the teachers of the law, and then they try to trap him. They use the law, the Torah, to try, try to help him get tangled up. They tell him the law states that she should be killed. We should stone her to death for her sin. But they don't state the whole law. Because Leviticus 20.10 says that the man would be put to death also for the same sin. And then Jesus... He bends down on the ground to write. He writes twice in the beginnings of chapter 8. What's he writing? We really don't know, but I want to tell you, based off of the circumstances and the timing and how much I spent studying this, I wondered if he, because he quoted over 100 times from 90 different passages of the Old Testament, usually used the Old Testament to prove his point. In Jeremiah 17, 13, I wonder if he wrote it. Because where he was, he says, it says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. He just gotten done teaching that. He is the living water. He's the one by the Holy Spirit that has come and sent the Holy Spirit as a gift to you and me to live on earth right now. The living water is in Jeremiah 17, 13, and then he, he may have written their names, no one knows. We don't know what he wrote, but he does say, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. He gives grace. Light comes into the darkness. Light comes into the situation. God's presence is revealed through Christ. And one by one, they walk away. And Jesus is gracious. Our God is gracious. Our God is merciful. That's how he looks at you this morning. He doesn't treat us as we deserve. Jesus reveals who God is. Because when you look at Jesus, you will see God. It reveals his nature, his character. He kindly treats the woman differently. He offers her grace and forgiveness. And that's who he is. So here in this temple, during this Feast of Tabernacles, the same feast that you and I will celebrate, you better listen up. Because what you've listened to as a story form, a narrative this morning, it's the feast that you and I will be celebrating in the Messianic Kingdom. Exodus 43, 45, Zechariah 14 will tell you more about it. God's lamp, God's light, the presence of God is tabernacle and dwelling among them, revealing light into their soul. He reveals light into your soul because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit on this side of the cross. God's holy light has become the salvation of their soul. He is God incarnate, dwelling, living, tabernacling with them and with us and yet they're not spiritually aware. And then Jesus uses second everyday occurrence during the Feast of the Tabernacles to bring us to the close. He would always use an everyday occurrence to teach a spiritual truth. So he uses the illumination ceremony during the feast as the backdrop. For he knew that they would understand what he was saying if he could point to what they were doing. The symbol of God's presence was light. For the word light comes from the Hebrew word menorah. 
The menorah was in the tabernacle in the wilderness for 40 years. It is a lampstand in Revelation 1, Zechariah 4, that has seven branches. What is interesting is the central one is supposed to be, is a says in scripture, the Lord, and the other ones, the, the, the little bowls at the top, they point toward the central piece. What is interesting is that's a painting on the left-hand side because the Jewish Orthodox Jews will not allow a menorah to actually be made to replicate what was in the tabernacle with seven, the perfect number. But over on the right is what's built in Jerusalem today. It's one of the 60 things that have been built waiting for the Dome of the Rock to come down. The earthquake or how God wants to do it, whoever, how God wants to do this, we don't know. For the temple to be rebuilt, you're looking at millions of dollars because it was made of pure gold, the scripture says. It's the one thing in, in it says in there, have God instructed exactly how to make it. It has to be one piece. It can't be many pieces. And it's over there now for people to already look at. It's a lampstand that has seven branches. It was told, God told Moses how to make it on the mountain when he gave the Ten Commandments. It was to symbolize God's care and God's presence among them when they were traveling that, by that cloud by day and that pillar of fire tonight. It was made of that pure gold, symbolic, symbolic, symbolic of who God was, holiness, purity, royalty. The lampstand reveals the sevenfold nature of the Spirit of God which we looked at in Revelation in the churches. It was God's lamp, it was God's light in the temple that featured those oil lamps, and oil always represents the Holy Spirit. It was prophetic of what Jesus was about to do. The light filled the tabernacle and later the temple. And here in this place, Jesus stands. And here are the large lampstands, probably they guess 70 to 75 feet. And each night there's this procession of the night before where the large lampstands were lit. The musicians are playing and they're singing these psalms of ascent. And the priests would climb up on the ladders of the platforms to reach the wicks that came from the priests' worn out garments that were ripped in long pieces when they were worn out and they were twisted to put into the oil and it was symbolic. And below the priests of the ladders are more priests and the Pharisees and they would dance. Here's these stern, austere people who were always about the law. But the Feast of the Tabernacles would come and they would dance with abandonment because they were longing for the Shekinah glory to fill the temple. They longed for the Promised One, the Messiah of the Old Testament, to come. They had waited, they were still waiting, they're still waiting today. They had anticipated Jewish feast after Jewish feast had taken place. And now the lampstands were lit. And when the lampstands are lit, all of Jerusalem could see the temple. It was a city on a hill they can't be hidden, Matthew 5. And in the fall of this Thanksgiving feast, he now makes the connection between where he stood, the temple, and himself. For during the feast, light has been central to the celebration, just like Christmas. Jerusalem was known as the light of the world. So Jesus uses this illumination ceremony where the temple lights are lit, and that was, it was promised through the Old Testament to connect them with the messianic hope of the, the temple being filled once again with God's lamp, God's light, he being that light. He stands among these lampstands. I can't imagine, I've tried to visualize this for weeks. The great lights, the lamps, people can see it for miles. And while they were lit, the glow and the glow of the next morning because they're still burning down before they're lit again, He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. To stand in the place where he was standing when he said this, in conjunction with the Feast of the Tabernacles, is like saying, I am the pillar of fire in the Old Testament. I am the Shekinah glory in the tabernacle. I am God's provision of his presence. I am the long-awaited Messiah. The statement is full of Old Testament allusions. 
He establishes his deity. He wants them to believe as him as that light that has now come for his people, the Jews and then the Gentiles, the whole world, that he's not just a good teacher, a good rabbi, a good miracle worker. He has come to save them and to save us from our sin. And he connects these dots of what he said to the wealth of the messianic prophecy which they would recognize, the lamp, the light, the menorah, the fire, where the Ark of the Covenant had been, that among them now stood Christ, the Son of God, the light of the world, the Messiah. John 1, 4 through 5 says, In him was life, and that light was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not, nor will it be able to, overcome it. Jesus said later in John 3, he said, Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. And what's so interesting is in John 9, just a few days later past this, he reaches down, he puts mud on the blind man's eyes, the one who had never seen light. And then he instructs him to go down to the pool of Siloam, where the living water is, and wash. And the man is obedient. He does what Jesus says and Jesus heals him of his blindness. Jesus says in John 9, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am in the light of the world. No half-hearted followers exist in Jesus' mind. John 12, you are going to have the light for just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Those who walk in the dark, Do not know where they are going. Put your trust in the light while you have the light so you may become children of light. And that's what God says this this morning. Turn to the light. Come to the light. Come to Jesus Christ. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. Allow his grace to search your heart. Proverbs 20, 27. The lamp of the Lord searches the spirit of a man. It searches out what he really thinks, who he is in his most inmost being. Let's stand. We're going to sing if the the worship team would come back up. But I just want to tell you the end of the story as they come. Let's look at Revelation 21. Revelation 21 says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamb. And night shall be no more. They will not going to need light. They will not need the light of the lamp or the sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. And that's the end of the story. Let's sing. Father God, you are majesty. We stand in awe and adoration because, God, all the dots connect from the beginning of time to the moment of standing here, it all connects. God, we take so much for granted. We get up in the morning and the sun comes up or it doesn't come up, but when the light is out, we are appreciative. Did we know, God, on this side that heaven will be light? You're already letting us see what light is. There will be no darkness in heaven. We are so appreciated to you for what you've done in creation. You are majestic. You are gloried. We want to glorify you, God, by humbling ourselves and not taking you for granted. It's a new year. A new day is coming. God, you gave us the hope, the light of the world. Through the birth, through the death, through the power of the resurrection. We call you Savior. You call us friend. Jesus, burn your light in us as we go. May we tell those in, among our path the story of God, the redemption that was given to us that gave us that free gift of eternal life. Heaven is our home. We're just passing through on this side. Thank you, God, that we can end the year with this thought. God, may you be magnified and glorified in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you. Happy New Year.